Hello. This lesson will be about digital circuit design. This is designed for electronic technology students, not for computer engineering students or computer science students so much, but it's an introduction to digital circuit design. What I hope you learn from this lesson is to understand binary numbering systems and why it's used in digital electronic circuits, know and identify the logic gate symbols, design and use truth tables to describe the functioning of digital circuits, and to be able to use Boolean algebra to write logic states, and to use gray code and Carnot maps or K-maps to simplify the design of digital logic circuits. Finally, to recognize the benefits of simplifying circuit design for cost and simplicity. Step one of designing a digital circuit is to write down what you want your circuit to do, to write down what it is you want to accomplish. For our example, since I also teach robotics, let's think of a self-driving robot that moves forward unless an obstacle is in its way. Let's say for our robot we're going to use three different sensors. So we need three sensor inputs and one output to tell the motors to turn on and drive forward or not. Once we've identified what we want our circuit to do, the next step is to write a truth table. You have your inputs in columns and then an output. We're going to have three inputs, touch sensor, IR sensors, and ultrasonic sensors. We'll call those inputs A, B, and C, and then we'll have one output for the motors. I think it's easiest in the long run if you write your truth table with inputs in gray code. Gray code was actually a code developed by a man named Frank Gray in 1947. He was working for Bell Labs. People work with binary and digital logic circuits because states need to have either a on or off state so that they can be easily worked with. Because transistors work essentially in that manner, you can work a transistor to be on or off. Since all digital logic circuits work with transistors, it's best to work with binary code. But when you're working with binary code and changing the bits, if you're adding in binary, there are times when all of the bits will change at the same time. And Frank Gray recognized that that could be a bad situation because at the moment of transition, the output may not recognize what state the inputs are in. That's not good. It might go with an incorrect output. He devised a way to change only one bit at a time in a binary number. Here's an example of how to do gray code. In the farthest right input column in our truth table, we'll write the first two bits alternating. So we'll start with a 0 and then alternate it to a 1. Then draw a line under it, this line here representing the mirror. So with that mirror in place, the idea is to reflect the bits above it. Here it shows reflected the 1 and the 0 alternating. Once you have that first column, then write the bits in the next input column, also alternating. But in this column, we're going to put two inputs. So we'll have two zeros, then two ones. Then we draw another mirror to reflect. And so here's our two column reflection. Then we continue on with our next column to the left. We add four bits, though. The first column has one bit alternating. Second column has two bits alternating. And then we do it in multiples of two, so the third column has four bits alternating. So we'll have four zeros, then four ones. If you look at this, each row has only one bit different than the row above it. So this is the way you write out gray code in a truth table so that only one bit at a time is changing. Now that we have our truth table filled out with gray code on the inputs, then we fill out the outputs of the truth table. The next step would be to evaluate, think about that output, um, and considering uh, failures, possible failures of sensors, how do you make your circuit robust to carry out what you really want to happen? So imagine the case where one of the sensors fails. Say, uh, say the IR sensor fails. Um, if it's not detecting an object ever, it would still allow the motors to move forward, but only if the touch sensors and ultrasonic sensor also didn't detect anything. But in some ways, that's not good. You may not realize there's a, a failed sensor. So eventually consider the fact that maybe all three sensors would fail and then the motors would always move forward. Uh, an opposite kind of failure would be where a sensor fails in an on state so that it always detects an object. If it fails in that way, then the robot can never move forward. So as we look at that, you know, evaluating how you want your robot to move, let's say we want to build some redundancy in for the possibility of a failed on state. In that case, we want maybe two out of the three sensors are not detecting an object in front, and then the output can still move forward. As long as two out of the three sensors say it's okay, we'll move forward. In this case, this is what our outputs will look like now. 
So step five would be to write up Boolean algebra terms to represent these logic states. Boolean algebra is just another way of writing the states the way you want them. They just use symbols to represent those different states. So for example, the first output is the condition where not A, not B, and not C happen. So we'll use this little symbol A with a line over it to represent not A. B next to it, this can be read as not A and not B and not C, and then we'll say that equals one or true. That's our output. The next line, I would have also the output is true, so I can say, well, it's not A, not B, but C. So not A and not B and C is a, a true condition. If I have an output that's off, I don't need to even write that condition, so I'm gonna skip the next line and go to the fourth line. I have not A and B and not C is a true condition. Skipping my untrue conditions, I go down to my final condition that's true, and I have A and not B and not C. For my final Boolean algebra term, I include all of the true output conditions. So I have not A and not B and not C. The plus sign means or, not A and not B and C, or not A and B and not C, or A and not B and not C. All of those would be true output conditions. So the next step is to sketch the combinatorial logic circuit using the symbols for the logic gate. So this is where you need to be familiar with logic gate symbols. What I've shown here is the triangle symbol with the circle on it. That is a not gate. The rounded symbol uh, on the end it looks like uh, maybe a long letter D, capital letter D, that's an AND gate. And then the spaceship looking symbol, we'll call it, that's an OR gate. For this combinatorial logic circuit to be the way we want it, according to this Boolean algebra equation, which we derived from our truth table, we will need four three input AND gates feeding into a single four input OR gate. This type of Boolean algebra equation is called a sum of the products. When you use an AND gate, that's a product term. If you use a plus, that's an OR gate. So this is a sum of the products. So these product terms all added together or summed together. So this type of a system we call the sum of the products. So we will need four three input AND gates, one four input OR gate, and three NOT gates. So this is a fairly complex logic circuit. Our next step would be to simplify that logic circuit if it's possible. The reason is, with more types of gates and more numbers of gates, you add more cost and complexity. So if we can reduce the number of gates and reduce the number of kinds of gates to the simplest possible, we'll reduce the cost of our circuit. And that uh, you know may not be much if you're just building one of these circuits, but if you're building this for uh, mass production, and you can cut costs a few cents per circuit, you can save a lot of money in the long run. And the circuit will be less likely to fail. Again, the more numbers of parts, the more positions for failure to happen. By simplifying the design, we can save time and money in both production and repair. So we're gonna use a technique called a Carnot map to simplify this logic circuit. Nowadays, there's also software programs that can be used to simplify very complex logic circuits. But with only three inputs, it's not a very complex design, and using a Carnot map will help you understand how these software programs are developed to help simplify digital circuit design. And it's a good practice to understand how to simplify even in your head. It helps you to think more clearly and design better circuits. So Carnot maps were developed by a man named Maurice Carnot in 1953, also working at Bell Labs as a telecommunications engineer. He was trying to design telephone switching circuits and wanted to simplify them by reducing the number of gates and inputs used in these logic circuits. A Carnot map is just another way of displaying all the possible logic states of a truth table, but the advantage is that we can easily identify common outputs resulting from different inputs, so we can reduce the number of inputs needed. To make a Carnot map, or, or what people call a K-map, 
you draw a square box with one input variable as the row across the top and the other input variable as the column down the left side. And then you list the inputs in the top left corner. And then you have rows and columns for each logic state of each input. So for example, we'll do a two input Carnot map to start with. Listing input A in a column down the side, input B as a row across the top. We can take our truth table and rewrite it on a Carnot map this way. Our first true output we want in this position right here because that's where A is false and B is true. So A false, B true, so we have an, a true output there. Our second true output right here is when A is true and B is true, or A is 1 and B is 1, our output is 1. So that's how you position them on a Carnot map. Any adjacent ones in columns or rows that are not diagonal, they need to be adjacent, either side by side or one above the other, they show commonalities or simplified results. In this example, these two, one above the next, are common inputs. What this shows is that the A input is irrelevant. Whether it's off or on doesn't really matter. Our output's going to be on. The only relevant input is if B is true. We can simplify our design to just have B as the only input. For another example of a Carnot map, let's start with a combinatorial logic circuit here. We have three AND gates leading to a three input OR gate and we have two NOT gates. We could represent this logic circuit with the truth table as a Carnot map. So what we have is our A inputs, our B inputs, and then we can use our logic circuit to decide when this is going to be true. Let's start with the condition of A being OFF and B also being OFF. The output from this AND gate is OFF, so this input into an OR gate would be OFF this input to the OR gate would be OFF. And our third AND gate is coming from this OFF from A input, but an AND gate, they both have to be on, so this output from the AND gate would be OFF. All three conditions to the OR gate are OFF, so our output would also be OFF. Now let's look at the condition where A is on but B is OFF. So with A on and B OFF, I have a true condition. If I switch B to an ON condition, then that line is going to be on and this AND gate output is going to be on. So no matter what the other inputs to the OR gate are, as long as it has one true input, it's going to be a true output. So A and B both being true is going to lead to a true output. Our only other condition is where B is on but A is off. Our output on that AND gate is on leading to an on, so that condition is also true. To make a three input K map, you just use an eight cell box, but you have two inputs across the top. Now you need to use gray code as you write the two inputs together. Let's go back to simplifying our original autonomous robot car. We're gonna need a three input K map to simplify it. Now our output needs to be according to this Boolean algebra equation. So here's our Carnot map. Only true conditions are when not A, not B, and not C all are true. So that's that case right there. Or not A, not B, and C are true. So that is that case right here. Not A and B and not C is this case right here. Or A and not B and not C is this case right here. Those four conditions are our outputs. So when we look at commonalities, these two are stacked on top of each other. So those are common. And these three are side by side, actually. You have to imagine this Carnot map as being rolled around and taped end to end. So those are our common conditions. So our true conditions, or our solutions, is A, or B naught and C naught, or B naught and C, or B and C naught. So that's our new simplified Boolean equation. So now using that simplified solution, let's resketch or redraw our schematic. And here it is. It simplified our design. We have six gates instead of eight. This can be less expensive to build and have fewer possible fail points. So that's why it's important to optimize or simplify digital circuit design. And I hope this example helped you to understand how to go about doing that step by step. Hopefully this has been a useful lesson for you, and best wishes for you to design your logic circuits.